Support for Outdoor Nevada comes from Land Rover Las Vegas and Jaguar Land Rover Reno, proud to help introduce a new generation of adventurers to the diverse experiences that our state has to offer. Information at lrlv.com or jlrreno.com. Nevada, a landscape as diverse as it is epic. Where wide open nature and wild adventure call to the curious and the brave alike. Just this door, how do I even operate it? Well, that's why you're a guy. <laughs> you need to, treat, to train you. Just the door is so impressive. I travel back to the 1930s to discover the story behind Scotty's castle in Death Valley. Key to this trail system is that it connectivity. Yeah, think of it as a, uh, a large bicycle spoke with a lot of uh, spokes and linkages going off. It's a perfect day for a bike ride and I'm at the perfect place for it, the River Mountains Loop Trail. As you can see, Dennis has, is full of just amazing stories. It's fantastic being here. And in Goffs, California, I visit an abandoned town with a history that has survived. All right, so it's how tall? It's 164 feet. It's the tallest wall in the world. All right, and you brought your best guy with you, right? Yep. In downtown Reno, I take on a rock wall. Yeah! What a rock! I'm John Byrne. I have a passion for the outdoors. Today we're in the Valley of Fire. It's a mid and I'm on a mission to show you the one of a kind history, science, nature, an adventure you find when you step outside. This is Outdoor Nevada. As I explore the state of Nevada, history is always on the itinerary. Today, I'm traveling back in time. My destination, 1939. How you doing, John? I'm great. How are you doing? Wonderful. Glad you to look have you here. fantastic. Hey, I'm uh, 1939 right here at Scotty's. <laughs> and you look good. This place is spectacular. Meet Scott Combs, a tour guide here at the castle. I hear he has a moat load of stories. Tell me a little bit about it. Well, uh, it actually belonged to um, a uh, wealthy man from Chicago. His name was Albert Johnson. And Albert Johnson uh, was an insurance executive. Now, you wouldn't expect somebody named Albert Johnson to own a place called Scotty's Castle. Strange. But, yeah, but Scotty's Castle is named after another gentleman. His name is uh, Walter Scott. Now, Walter Scott is better known by his, uh, his characterization as, as Death Valley Scotty. That was uh, a man who claimed he had a gold mine in Death Valley, got a lot of investors, including Albert Johnson. They all came out here and found out that Scotty really didn't have that gold mine after all. But it created a friendship that grew over the years between Albert Johnson and, and Walter Scott. And uh, that's really why we're here today, because Albert Johnson came, built a castle in the desert, called it Death Valley Ranch, but it's always been known as Scotty's Castle. I cannot wait to see what's inside. All right, well, we'll go just a minute, but first, we need to get you in costume. Really? Yeah, come on ahead. Oh, I'm so into it, let's go. Now that I'm all decked out in my 1930s attire, I feel ready to hear all of Scott's and Scotty's tales. Just this door, how do I even operate it? Well, that's why you're a guy. <laughs> I need to, treat, to train you. Just the door is so impressive. Uh, I want to give you a little bit of the history and introduce you to the castle before we go inside. But, I feel uh, like I'm in another country now. Well, you are kind of, at least in the 21st century. Mm. Again, construction began in 1922. Uh, ended in 1931. Of course, we are talking about Albert Johnson building Scotty's Castle. Well, it's about 12,000 square feet under roof uh, between the annex and the castle proper. It's really here because of a friendship that exists between Death Valley Scotty and, and Albert Johnson began in 1906 at a place called Wingate Pass. Incredible. This is the Great Hall. To understand the story of the castle, you have to understand the relationship between Albert Johnson and Death Valley Scotty. See, Albert Johnson, was uh, a wealthy man, but he was a private man. 
didn't want or need publicity. And then he builds a castle in the desert in the 1920s, and you're gonna get publicity whether you want it or not. <laughs> so when their friend Death Valley Scotty began to claim ownership of this castle, and it became known as Scotty's Castle, well, they had to carry that on, and the Johnsons supported it, because then they didn't have to answer questions about why they were here. But an evening in 1939, you actually could have rented a room and spent the night in this house. And had you done so, you would have expected entertainment. And the entertainment at Scotty's Castle in 1939 was a well-known storyteller, and his name was Death Valley Scotty. <laughs> of course You might was. have come down from your room in 1939 and found Scotty seated in this middle chair. To his right would have been Bessie Johnson, and to his left would have been Albert, and seated around them, the guests of an evening, Scotty entertaining them with banter and stories. The provincial Spanish villa still holds the original furniture installed by the Johnsons, and it's visited by 100,000 people every year. Oh my gosh. This is the upper music room, and it has a special treat we often, uh, well, we always share with our visitors. What are the uh, the rods that go across? Well, they're they're pretty uh, nice looking, but they're also functional because uh, they actually hold the arch in place. But, uh, well, I have a little special thing I want to show you here, oh, and I just ask you to kind of stand right here okay. and just give me just a sec. This self-playing piano was installed in 1929. Back then, the keyboard was hidden behind curtains, and the role player closed, so its mysterious operation amazed and entertained guests. I want one of these. I want whatever this is, I want one of this. As much as I want to stay here, there's one more historical room in this castle I have to see. This is uh, actually Scotty's bedroom. The Johnsons uh, did build and furnish it for him. The photographs on the wall are from Scotty's past. A portrait at the far end as well, that is Buffalo Bill. And he worked for Buffalo Bill for about 12 years uh, in the uh, Wild West show. But, um, well, Scotty, he was a bit of a deceptor. Part of the deception has to do with his bedroom. Because you see, I told you about Scotty telling stories out there. And, uh, well, he told people that he, at the end of the evening that it was time to go to bed. And he'd walk right into this room. He'd change into uh, other clothes, his desert clothes, get into his car outside that door, and drive right around that ridge all the way back to the house he really lived in. He was deceptive, but he was charming. He was absolutely charming. And he certainly made a lot of people happy especially that guy named Albert Johnson. Well, it took some time, but Scotty and Albert finally got their castle in the middle of the desert. I tell you, going back in time was never so much fun. Incredible views, unique wildlife, and a memorable experience just around the corner. The River Mountains Loop Trail System connects it all. Personally, I love to get outside and go biking. It's one of my favorite things to do. And so when I travel, I'm always looking for some place that I can do that in the city that I'm in. And in this area, I think I just found it. The River Mountains Loop Trail. And we're going to talk to the guy that actually developed this trail system. He's a real pillar of the community. Great guy. His name's John Holman. John Holman, along with private landowners and government agencies, built the trail for non-motorized bikers and hikers to enjoy. Hey, John. Hey, John, how you doing? Good to see you. Good to meet you. Welcome to the River Mountain Loop Trail. Boy, there's no place I'd rather be today. Absolutely, it's beautiful out today with all the wildflowers and the colors. Gorgeous, how big is this trail? How long is this trail? The trail is 34 miles. No it, kidding. It loops all the way around the River Mountains, which separates us from Lake Mead. The trail connects us to uh, Boulder City, the Lake Mead, to Hoover Dam, and uh, by its loop, it connects us to all the rest of the valley. It's in great condition. When did the whole project start? Planning started in early 1997, and we had a group get together. We called them the River Mountain Loop Trail Partnership, and uh, we, we met monthly, put the plan together, and uh, the first piece of trail went down in 2000. So it's been 16 years almost since the planning and everything else. Well, I know but, you brought some, some bikes, bikes out, huh? Absolutely. Let's give them a try. All right, is that one mine? Uh, right over here. Let's jump on and let's go. Over a decade in the making, the trail was completed in 2012. It's 12 feet wide and includes paved stretches and an equestrian trail. Now, people, when they come out here, they take all kinds of modes of transportation, don't they? Bicycle seems to be the most popular, but people hike. We see a lot of joggers, and uh, in this neighborhood, a lot of folks uh, walk their dogs. 
You bring horses that yeah, think that's not motorized, right? Anything not motorized. What do you call this thing? This is, I call it an incumbent, but it's called a trike, I think. <laughs> All right. Well, let's go. All right, I'm following you. Woohoo! You live in the area. I mean, this, this park means a lot to you, doesn't it? Yeah, I've been coming here for a long time. Well, until uh, the trail got built, this was really a, a wide open area for hiking and all kinds of exploration, and we did that with our kids when we were young. John, tell me about the, uh, the access points, because there's 34 miles here, so how do you get onto this trail? Well, we've just experienced one here, what they call the Silverman Connector, but there are trailheads all along the trail, in both in Henderson, Lake Mead, and Boulder City. And those, those access points are uh, either parks or they're uh, uh, just plain places that you can park safely and uh, get onto the trail. Uh, one of the best ones up here at the Railroad Pass, that's where mile marker zero is. And so you can use the upper parking lot there to uh, get on the trail and you can go either direction from that standpoint. You can ride from dawn to dusk. The trail rises over 1,300 feet from its lowest to highest point. The distant cityscapes contrast with the vibrant nature nested in the trail. You know what's amazing? We've been out here this whole time. I haven't seen one piece of trash, not one. Well, it's a great news because uh, uh, we just cleaned it up on Saturday and uh, the users use it a lot. They adapt the trail and they pick up after themselves. And anybody I saw on the trail was smiling and waving. That's got to make you feel good. It does. You bump into people on the trail when you're hiking and you talk, get to talking to them and that's exactly right. They love the trail and they, they really appreciate it. And that's, that makes me happy. I appreciate it too, John. One portion, the historic railroad trail, was built in the 1930s during construction of the Hoover Dam. There are five tunnels and incredible beauty along the scenic spur of the loop. You and I are doing about a two mile trek today. Yeah. But the key to this trail system is that it's connectivity. Yeah, think of it as a, uh, a large bicycle spoke with a lot of uh, spokes and linkages going off. There's uh, trail hookups all around the uh, entire loop. Uh, the, probably the best known is the historic railroad trail over at Lake Mead. But there's a wetlands connector that goes into the Clark County Wetlands Park. Uh, there's a Lake Mead Parkway Trail and the Burkholder Trail. And soon there'll be a connection, an easy connection to the Union Pacific Railroad Trail that the Henderson has that uh, will take you into the core of downtown Henderson and eventually hooks you up to the Las Vegas segment of the railroad. Why do you care so much about this? Why'd you get involved in this? Well, I've always done trail volunteer vacations to, to build and maintain trails. And uh, it was an opportunity. We worked with the, the Park Service for a whole uh, three or four years building portions of the historic railroad trail. And I just uh, have a desire to build trails and see them connect and go places. You're like the modern day John Muir. Yeah. Well, I, I don't know about that, but uh, I've been called a lot of things. <laughs> but it's just, you know, the, the discovery of a trail. Where does the trail go? What's around the next yeah. corner? It's people like John Holman, with passion and respect for nature, who are behind inspiring projects like the River Mountains Loop Trail. It's people like me who get to use it and spread the word. Goffs, California was once a small but thriving stop on Route 66. It was founded as a rail siding in 1883 and prospered until 1931 when Route 66 was redirected and the town essentially disappeared. Here we are in this beautiful property out here in the Mojave. It's being kept alive and preserved by Dennis and his wife, Joanne. Let's go inside and meet him. You're gonna love him. Hi, nice to see you. Dennis, how are you? Good to see you. And it's Hugh? Good seeing you. You know, when you come pulling up here, one of the highlights, a building you can't wait to get in, is this one. Tell me about, we're in the schoolhouse now? Tell we're me about in the Goff school. Schoolhouse. It was built here in uh, 1914. Goff sat abandoned until 1998, when the Case Beers began transforming the dilapidated schoolhouse into a museum. Now, obviously, it hasn't always been in this condition, right? I mean, this is, this is mint. It, it served as a school until 1937. And then what happened? They built a new one down in Essex, 18 miles down the road, because Route 66 had bypassed 
the place. While in operation, the school taught as many as 20 students at a time from railroad, mining, and ranching families. Any of the uh, former students ever come back? Oh, yes. See, we've been here 25 years, Joanne and I. Yeah. We came here on 13th of February, 1990. And people, students, come back. But we didn't wait for them to come back. We went looking for them. So between 1911 and 1937, 412 different little human beings <laughs> went to school here. We know every, the name of every one of them. Hmm. And so we went looking for them and ha fashioned a, oral, a segment of our oral history program around them. So we found more than 40. So we actually found more than 10% of the students that went to school here. And between 1911 and 1937, there is no year for which we didn't have at least one person to interview. When they come back or, or they talk about it, can you see it on their face? Can you, what, do you know that they're a former student? You can see it in their tears sometimes. Dennis became fascinated with the desert while he served as a Marine during the Korean War. Goffs has a military history as well. Well, I've left out an important chapter of the history of this place. On the 7th of December, 1941, the Japanese attacked Pearl Harbor. And within less than a year, this became a part of the California Desert Training Center. General Patton was out here, hmm. putting together the troops to take to North Africa. Then in 1942, one of the divisions that came in here was the 7th Infantry Division. So they got trained in desert warfare. They got their blood thinned down and they gave them that lightweight clothing and they sent them to Alaska and they drove the Japanese out of the Aleutians. Of course they did. Very distinguished combat division. And when we first came here, there would not be a month go by, but what? One of those boys would come walking up the driveway, looking for his roots. How many boys were out here? 15,000 within a couple of miles of where you're standing. And it was a mechanized infantry division, so they had on the order of six or 7,000 vehicles. You can still find evidence of these soldiers today. By the time they left, there wasn't a bush or a blade of grass out here. Now the soil keeps turning things up, dog tags, ammunition, mess kits. One of the stories I like to tell is we were out in a valley a little to the south here one time and Joanne says, look, and she looked down and there was a set of dog tags complete with a chain, just like mine that I had. See, that wasn't all that long after World War II, six or seven years. As you can see, Dennis has, is full of just amazing stories. It's fantastic being here. This patch of the desert was once dotted with thousands of stamp mills, which crushed rock to expose metal ore. Well, what do we got here, Dennis? That's the 10 stamp ore mill. And not to be too obvious, I'm counting one, two, three, four, five on each side. That's why I got the name. Two five stamp batteries. So exactly how did this work now? They, they, they'd put this out in the middle of nowhere where they thought there was some gold. Put them out in the middle of nowhere, all over the American West. It may be the stamp mill and not the Winchester. Huh. That won the American West. That brought some form of civilization in the American West. They're all over the California desert, Nevada, Arizona. But they're gone now. This 1890 model took a half a dozen men to operate. The machinery helped shape American history. Now, why would you say that it may have been this machine and not the Winchester that won the American West? Well, everywhere one of these machines went, there was commercial activity, jobs. Oh. And uh, for the country to prosper, you gotta have jobs. That hasn't changed much either, has it? No, it has not. <laughs> it really has not. So, prospectors would fan out into these hills, and they would find a promising vein of ore, usually quartz rock, and they would crush it up with a hand crusher and find a little color in it. Next thing you know, they're, they're off in San Francisco or back east trying to sell shares of stock. Time has left history untouched here in Goffs, just like an open book waiting to be read. So Dennis, I want to take a second to thank you both. You're welcome. For not only 
for your time today, but for for keeping the history of this place alive for people to come and see it and, and learn. If it wasn't for you, uh, there'd be a whole lot of history that'd be lost. I'm gonna have to agree with you. <laughs> Turns out it's true. The tallest rock climbing wall on earth stands right here in the biggest little city in the world. Hey, Brian! How are you? Good seeing you. Good, yeah. You slacker, that was awesome. <laughs> I do my best. <laughs> this whole place is great. What, what all goes on here? We actually have the world's tallest climbing wall. He's got me thinking. He's got me thinking. Hey, can I try out some of this stuff? Absolutely, let's get you geared up. Oh, right on, let's go. Avid rock climber Brian Sweeney shows me the ropes for today's challenge. We have climbing shoes right here for you. Good. And then a harness. Okay. And then chalk to help dry out your hands. Well, you got it all covered, don't you? Yeah, we have everything you need. All right, let's put this stuff on. Cool. Indoor climbing gained recognition in the 1980s and locations like this provide a safe, comfortable environment for climbers of all levels. Okay, what do we do? With this one, You'd start here and here, follow the brown tape, and just go up this way. Oh, you follow the brown tape? Yeah. And then up. Guy makes it look easy, doesn't he? Just zips right up. So I start down. Uh, yeah, wherever is comfortable. Whoa. There you go, good. Yeah. Where am I going? Uh, as high as you feel comfortable. <laughs> yeah, good. Nice. Awesome. Good work. Now you're ready for the big wall. Serious? Yeah. That's all it takes? You got it. All right. I trust my teacher. <laughs> Sensei. Oh, let's do it. <laughs> it's time to take this indoor climbing outdoors. All right, so it's how tall? It's 164 feet. It's the tallest wall in the world. All right, and you brought your best guy with you, right? Yep, I got my belayer Cayman right here. He'll All right. be belaying us up. And, and the idea is to stay extended. Yeah, so if you keep your weight low and in your musculature and on your feet, it'll save your uh, muscles a ton of energy so you're not clenched like this the whole time. How much of this is brute strength? How much is technique? Uh, I'd say, you know, most people think it's all strength, but really it's probably like 20% strength, about 50% uh, technique, and the rest of it is all head. All right, you ready to go? Yeah. Go get him, brother. All right, thanks. All right. Now, I know you've got the land speed record for this, right? Yeah. How long did it take you? Uh, I did it in two minutes and 15 seconds. Unbelievable. There are three main types of climbing competition, lead, speed, and bouldering. All right, here we go, climbing. Gosh! This guy's like Spider-Man, he's so light, he's so quick, it's no surprise that he holds the record for climbing this. Yeah! That's amazing! Yeah! You gotta ring that bell now. I mean, I knew you could do it, but you did it so well. Dude, Spider-Man lives! That's awesome! <laughs> Brian, who's been climbing for 17 years, is a hard act to follow. Any last minute advice? I just rely on your legs. Keep moving. All right. And breathe. And breathe. Yeah. Here's what I'm going to do. My goal, since I've not, I'm not an experienced rock climber, my goal coming out here is to have fun. And I'm going to see if I can get to that first wrinkle up there. It's about, what, halfway, maybe a little more? How about that? I'd say a little over half. All right, that's going to be my goal today. Let's do this thing. Here we go. Have fun. I love being outdoors. It rocks. Nice, John. Yeah. Awesome, man. Keep it up. Keep it up. Use those legs. Yep. Look for the good holes, man. Yeah. Awesome. Keep moving. You got it, dude. Right. 
Oh. Oh. Nice. Woo. Well, my respect for you was big before, but now, having been to the top of the mountain in my world, that was awesome. you're awesome. The top of the wall will have to wait. I met my goal today, and in the end, it's all about the climb. If you're into rock climbing, you absolutely must come out here and do this. And if you've never done this before, you absolutely must come out here and do it. And don't try and get to the bell. Don't worry about that. Just like get as high as you can possibly get and you'll be a success. I got to tell you something. You're amazing. I want to be like you when I go up. Thanks, man. Maybe, I'll, great time. maybe I'll come back tomorrow and try it again. Yeah, let's do it. Let's do it. Right. Let's get some water. All right. Sounds good. Woo! Support for Outdoor Nevada comes from Land Rover Las Vegas and Jaguar Land Rover Reno, inspiring the spirit of adventure with confidence in any terrain. Information at lrlv.com or jlrreno.com.